Welcome, everyone. My name is Justin Papernia with White Collar Advice, and it's my privilege today to welcome my good friend and client, Ron Thorg-Martin, who's going to be surrendering to federal prison here very soon. Hi, Ron. Welcome. Hey, Justin. How are you today? I'm well. We're grateful that you're willing to be vulnerable and share some lessons you have learned while traversing this government investigation with us. Many of you will be wondering, is he going to prison when and for how long? Yes, yes, and yes. He's going to Montgomery soon for six years. The government asked for 14, and we're going to kind of reverse our engineer way back to the beginning with some things he did well, and in retrospect, some things he potentially could have done differently. To that end, Ron, I would like to just listen for a few minutes about who you are and where you're from so our audience has a better understanding of, of who you are. Sure. Uh uh, originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, uh, by way of Florida, and, and currently located in uh, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my um, uh, my profession, for the better part of my life, was in the retail business. My uh, for those of you that are on the East Coast, my family business was H.H. H. Gregg's. Um, so I, I was very blessed that I grew up uh, in that family, learned a lot, uh, moved from that into commercial development, and uh, along the way. Uh, I got involved in the cattle industry, which is what eventually led to uh, to, to my demise. Uh, but currently, I'm, I'm calling you or calling in from uh, Beaufort, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. Well, one thing you, you never do, Ron, is complain. You always find the good in things. It's pretty remarkable because there are some people, I would argue, like me. I, I'm not saying someone has an excuse to become involved in the criminal justice system. But my journey through baseball and everything was pretty well documented. Coaches who were holding me accountable, parents who were, you know, were very involved in my life and helped me understand the concepts of right and wrong. So if there's anyone who never should have gotten involved in the system. It was me. And I mentioned you never complain. And I'm not asking you to get into all of the trauma and details, but you endured growing up and had parts of an upbringing that you probably wouldn't wish on Anyone, if you're willing to touch on it, please do so. And then I'd love you to address if that very difficult upbringing kind of conditioned you for some of the trauma or adversity that accompanies a, a government investigation, because you have never complained once about the situation you created. Well, those are all good questions. And, and the, answer, the answer with the basic one, do I think that my uh, difficult upbringing uh, made it easier for me to to deal with or or uh, go through this process of the journey as we refer to it. And I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, I was I would be the kid that grew up on the other side of the tracks. I uh, I grew up. Or I was uh, uh, born to a, a mother who was 16 years old. We lived in uh, downtown Indianapolis, literally downtown. Um, we moved around a lot. Uh, she was gone most of the time. Alcoholic drug addict, uh, you just about name it, and, and those are the things I dealt with, uh, which that, because of those things, it ended, ended me up in, in a position where I was uh, adopted, and I was adopted, as I mentioned earlier, by a, a fine family. Um, they were the founders of H.H. Uh, Craig's. They took me in. Uh, they kind of put me on the right path. Um, I was fortunate enough not quite as good as Justin, but I did play sports. Sports kind of kept kept me out of trouble as I as I moved through uh, high school because uh, you just you, you just didn't have a choice but to, to fly right. You couldn't do drugs, you couldn't drink. Uh, but that rough upbringing and, and what I saw living on the other side of the tracks definitely made it easier to for me to deal with this process. And and, and I think uh, and I appreciate the compliment about always being positive. And and I guess I decided some point in this process, and I would say probably the association with white collar advice and, and prison professors, I, I kind of I kind of was empowered to know that I had some control, and, and, and that control of my outcome led me to create a positive persona around myself. Because up until then, I felt like I'd lost all control. Uh, the process was leading me; I wasn't leading anything. Uh, nothing was happening the way that I hoped it would. And I, I felt like I was just in the backseat along, along on a terrible ride. So it wasn't until my association and, and the empowerment that I received from our community, um, it just changed everything for me. It was, it was very impactful. 
I appreciate you saying that. One, one thing we can control as a defendant is uh, our attitude and how we respond to a government investigation. As many people know, as he drinks out of his Indianapolis Colts cup, staying loyal to back home. <laughs> one thing, we, we can't control the, the government's version of, of events, and we can't control the DOJ press releases they put out there, what co-defendants or cooperators might do. But we can choose how we respond to it, especially if, if we're parents and our family is watching, and I know you have children and they can learn from the, this legacy and, and how you respond to it. Let's go back a little bit. Growing up in the other side of the tracks, did you see people going in and out of prison? For me, it was foreign. I didn't know anyone that had ever gone to, to prison. Was it something that you saw growing up? It was, and on a regular basis. Uh, now, I didn't have, uh, uh, I never did visitations in prison. I never was that close. But yes, uh, in the environment I grew up, uh, people were going to jail. That's what we called it. They were going mm -hmm. to jail on a regular basis. It didn't matter if it was, if it was state or federal. Yeah. We only knew of one jail that was jail. So yes, yes, on a regular basis. Now, you had had success throughout your career, and we know it, it ended here with a, a government in investigation. Can you walk us through the origins of the government investigation. You mentioned the cattle industry. I'll be direct with you. I live in Orange County. I don't have any idea what that means, okay? <laughs> I know what it means, but I can never imagine. I'm like a banker, okay? I'm a real estate guy. I don't know. What does that mean you worked in the cattle industry? Well, and it's, and it's interesting you say that because I am definitely not a cattle expert either, but uh, but I was very successful. I was successful in the, uh, in the family business, and then when I was... Uh, approximately 27, 28 years old, uh, my father and I split off, my adopted father, and created our own real estate development company, which was very successful. And, uh, and, and I'm very proud to say that, uh, um, that we were making a lot of money. And at that time, um, as you're making money, you're always looking for places, where can I put my money to, to grow it? Uh, obviously, you're going to put it in your business, you put it in the stock market. Well, stock market for me at that time had been awful. We'd just gone through the internet bubble, which I took a beating on, and then we had 9-11, uh, uh, which I took a beating on, and I can remember saying to myself, I'm going to quit putting money in places where I can't control it. Uh, so I took it took it all out of the stock market. About that time, a friend of mine said, I want to introduce you to a guy over in Illinois. He's in the cattle business. We've been investing money with him, and we're making about 30% per year return. 30% was just like unheard of. That was, that was more than I made my primary business. So my father and I met with this gentleman. Um, his name was Mark Ray. And, uh, uh, we were very impressed with his operations. We actually had him over because we were a little leery of the returns. We actually had him over to our county firm in Indianapolis, which was er Ernst & Young, which is you know, top three in the country. Had them betting. Uh, uh, he went through their process. They were, they were, they were fine with it. So we started doing business with Mark. Uh, that was in the early 2000s. Uh, because my primary business was commercial development, that's where I focused. When I say we were in the cattle business, all we were doing is providing money. Um, right around the time of the, uh, I call it the Great Recession, I think a lot of people do, uh, his business, along with others, my included, just fell apart. Could not withstand the pressures on the market. Uh, when his business fell apart, which was 2007, 2008, um, it was pretty crushing. Uh, we lost millions of dollars. At the same time, our real estate uh, uh, empire was crumbling. I can remember my my uh, adopted father telling me that uh, we could have survived the you know the, the the dismantling of the real estate company or or our investments in cattle, but not both. And both had happened. So after 2008, it was struggle just for me to keep from, from going bankrupt, which I was able to avoid. And then I had to put my life back together, which I started to do. Uh, it was very difficult to find a, a lot of banks or companies that were interested in, in real estate developers back in 2008, 2010, because the market just, just couldn't recover. Um, lo and behold, Mark Ray reaches out to me. It was uh, approximately 2010. And he is located, relocated out to Denver, Colorado. Now, not only was he a fourth generation cow person, but he was also a fourth generation uh, uh, a farmer. So he was out in Colorado and he was telling me about marijuana. And he said, I'm out here, they're going to legalize this marijuana, uh, medical marijuana. It's very complicated. You know, 
you're a smart guy. I've always looked up to you. Would you consider coming out and consulting for me in this industry? Well, there weren't a lot of people knocking on doors. Uh, uh, I'm not saying this just because we're on the interview. It's the truth. Marijuana was never my drug. It just, I, it just never stuck with me. Uh, but I looked at it as any other business. I needed the income. I took the job. So I went out to Colorado. It actually required me to relocate out there for a year. I tried to go quickly. Uh, it was heavily regulated. I enjoyed it. I, I loved how it was quickly changing in the laws, and I was having an impact on what they were what they were actually uh, putting on the books. Um, what spawned out of that, which was a good thing, is Wall Street uh, around 2012, 2013 started paying attention. And when Wall Street started paying attention, they wanted to find people that were like them, look like them, talk like them. They wanted to understand the industry, but they didn't want to deal with guys who grew up in the marijuana industry. And that was me. And uh, uh, I looked like them. I talked like them. So we were the same. And that kind of led to all kinds of opportunities. As a matter of fact, uh, I can't remember if it was Wolf Blitzer. One of the interviews I'd done, they, they, they had tagged me the poster child for legalized marijuana, which was my claim to fame in the marijuana industry. However, my problem question what led me to my, my interaction with the Department of Justice. My association with Mark Ray continued. And he was he was he was one of my best friends. He was like a brother. And I consulted for him. Well besides doing the marijuana industry, he was also continuing to do his cow business. And where I got intertwined in it was and I, I guess I, I should have been smart enough to know, but he basically was using me and my reputation to bring credibility to his operations. And what he ended up doing was creating a, 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 a cattle Ponzi scheme. So he was trading and selling the same cattle over and over, taking money from one investor to pay another. It was your atypical Ponzi scheme. And, uh, and I'm going all along and I'm consulting and I'm helping him do uh, contracts and loan agreements and inventories. And, and my presence brought credibility to him, especially since I had evolved in the marijuana industry to become a CEO of a publicly traded marijuana company. So people, he was using me as his, as his Ponzi. And uh, so my interaction with the Department of Justice started there. And uh, they immediately reached out to me and, and do you want me to go into the fatal mistakes? You want me to I, I want to get into the mistake, but also, I want to get into this mistake, but also address how how similar you and I are with respect to that case. If you were to read my plea agreement, the government alleges that because I was a vice president at Bear Stearns and then UBS, that I gave credence to my client who was the hedge fund manager, right? So he could go to he could go raise money from a mom and pop and take their $500,000. I wasn't there, but he'd say, look, I do business with Bear Stearns or UBS. They execute my trades. Here's the card of my of my broker, you can call and confirm that I have an account. So he, essentially, I gave him credibility that the government argued he had not earned, but it gave people the warm and fuzzies to do work with us. And that's when it led into that I knew or should have known that he was making criminal decisions. And that's going to tie in, tie in to, to you. With that said, I'm going to turn it back over to you. It was the same. It, it almost is exactly the same. Uh, matter of fact, I didn't even know that one. Or that was a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when uh, when I was going through that process, um, even the witnesses, and I'll jump ahead a little bit. I went to trial, mm -hmm. and, and the government put forth three witnesses. And the primary thing that the government uh, pounded on when those witnesses were testifying is the, they mostly invested with Mark Ray because of my reputation and who I was, and they couldn't imagine guy like me would be involved with a criminal like him. Well, it's, so it, let's back up. Let's back up for a moment. It's so interesting because we have all of these celebrities from the Jenners and others who will get paid a million dollars for a Instagram post and they don't disclose that it's paid. So people then invest in crypto or some product and lose everything because of the disclosure. Now they'll get sued civilly and they'll settle and write a check because it's nothing for them. Or they're not going to prison, but I've seen tens of there's messages all over the internet from people saying, I follow her, 
and invested in this because of her recommendation. I didn't know that she was getting paid, right? So it's not uncommon that someone would invest or make an investment if they believe that someone's credible. There is a difference of why are, are you getting prosecuted versus someone who is probably paid more you know, for a tweet. We can leave that elsewhere. Some are civil, some is, some is criminal. But I want everyone to, un to understand this is ubiquitous. Some are held to a slightly a different standard. You mentioned you went to trial. We'll get into that. There are some people when they learn that they're indicted or the feds arrest them at 6 a.m. with a gun to the head who are like, you've got the wrong house. What are you doing here? How did you learn that you were a target? Was a cooperating informant who led them to you? Did they show up with guns? Did the FBI leave a, a note or a business card? How did you know that you were the subject of an investigation? It was the worst possible story ever. First of all, to your point, probably like you, I assume like you, um, I, I felt 100% confident that I was. And the way I looked at it is, I never solicited anybody for money, never asked anybody for money, nor did any investor money ever go into my account. So to me, I was like, if I hadn't done those things, how could I be found guilty? Well, what I didn't know is, uh, is when the SEC, first it was started, the investigation started at the SEC, and then it rolled from the SEC to simultaneously with the Department of Justice. When this started to happen, the penis went out from the SEC. I went to my, because I was still CEO of a public trade company, I went to my long-term friend, probably as close as, as maybe a brother, and said, listen, Mark, I love you like a brother, but you've made some mistakes here. You're going to get in trouble, in my opinion. I cannot be associated with that. I, I, I'm CEO of a public trade company. It will not fly with the SEC. We parted ways. Within six months, his attorney took him to the Department of Justice. He made a deal to plead guilty, and they asked him to, to but he had to testify against his co-conspirators. My opinion, rather than than, than sacrifice his co-conspirators, he, he sacrificed me and, and his partner at the time, who was, who was like an older sister to me, 17-year-old nurse. He never even had a speeding ticket. So he told the Department of Justice, these two are my co-conspirators. So that's when we knew that we were going to get indicted. And the Department of Justice had called my attorney at the time, said to him that uh, we're really not interested in Ron. Uh, we think he's a low man on the totem pole. If he's willing to, to testify against uh, uh, his co-conspirator, who she had not done anything wrong, we're willing to make him a deal. And I refused. I could not have lived with myself. Um, and that, so that's what led to, that's how I found out. That's what led to it. Probably the, I can tell you the mistake I made is I should have considered just pleading guilty. And I think what's unfortunate and unfair to most people, and if you're, if they're watching this video, they're in some process of this journey. If I would have just known the conviction rate of federal cases that go to trial would have changed my decisions. But people just, they just assume the best thing they can do is hire an attorney and follow that attorney's advice, which is what I did to the T. What I learned through our community is to advocate for myself and to think for myself. The problem is it was a little late in the process. It wasn't too late, but it was late. So, so much of our stories align, for example, in my case, like yours, they found they got to my co-defendant first, and the government argued he was culpable. He ran the fraud before me. He got indicted on new charges while he was cooperating, so they ripped up his plea agreement. He was most culpable, yet government loves cooperating witnesses. Now, I'm in the consulting business, and we've had everything. We've had those who cooperate, those who are cooperated against. We're not making a judgment, but rather expressing to all of you the government doesn't care how you became immersed in a government investigation, right? There are people who are more culpable, who because of that cooperation, who can get a, a much shorter federal prison sentence. It is a warped system. And unless my co-defendant, and if he did not get indicted on new charges, I was the one looking at three or four years, and he was the one looking at 18 months, even though he was the whole orchestrator and the government made clear that I was involved on the periphery and he just kind of used my name as the broker. Yes, that's important for all of you who are watching to say, I didn't have bad intentions. I didn't start it. I didn't create it. What does the government want? What do we discuss every week in our webinars? Put yourself in the shoes of the stakeholders. What does the U.S. attorney want? 
He wants convictions. He wants restitution. He wants to advance his career. He wants press releases because someday that defense, that prosecutor is going to become what? A defense attorney, right? So we've got to understand the stakeholders. Now let's transition back to you. You choose not to cooperate against uh, your, your friend. You choose to go to trial. Your friend, of course, former friend who pled guilty is hoping that you do go to trial because he wants that coveted 5K1 letter, which is a cooperation agreement. You mentioned the conviction rates. It's more than 98%. Did they never ever offer a plea agreement to you? Did your lawyer negotiate it? Or was it like, hey, I didn't do anything wrong here. We're going to trial. But, well, and that's the scary thing is my, my attorney was very adamant that, uh, that we are not going to look at any plea agreement that deals with, um, with, with you doing time. Uh, you haven't done anything wrong. And, and, you know, that was the same thing over and over. Uh, we'll go to trial. And I can remember almost a month before the trial started, we were out there for some, some stuff that had to be done with the courts and violence and such, such before the trial started. And he said, the, the prosecution is, is going to approach me. They kind of indicated about a deal. And, and I go, okay, well, what would a deal look like? And, and the, again, I didn't know what the, as most people that are in our community don't, but he said, well, it's probably going to deal with home confinement. You know, I'm going to try to get you probation, but it's probably going to be home confinement for a period of time. I'm like, well, what's home confinement? And he's telling me, I said, well, can, can I go see my son play football? You know, well, well, I don't know. And so anyway, I was getting my hands around uh, what home confinement was. And within a week or two, um, I found out that, uh, that my attorney basically had said no to any plea agreement, not even send us one, because he said if it's anything that deals with my client doing actual time in prison, the, deal, the answer is no. I'm not saying I'm not blaming that on my attorney, but I'm just saying I wished I had been smart enough. I was to have been able to evaluate whatever offer they would have put forth. And um, and that's the mistake I made. I should have done that. Well, I should have been more informed. Well, it's interesting how all of our stories align. I mean, even, you know, Michael the, I, holding up this book from our webinar earlier, he served 26 years in prison for a drug crime. But in Earning Freedom, he writes about how. He just bought everything his lawyer said to him and insinuated with enough money, we can win at trial and never contemplated accepting responsibility. I'm not going to mention your lawyer's name. I'm sure they worked hard and they did what they thought was in your best interest. So I'm not impugning the, the lawyer's character here. But if I might ask, did you were you paying inclusively or were you paying hourly as this was dragging out? Well, and this is, to me, this was very odd. Um, my attorney made me a deal, and, and, and it was it was in the, it was in the, the mid six figure mm -hmm. uh, number, and it was a flat fee, whether whether I went to trial or not. Mm -hmm. and the reason I mention that and stress it is um, I felt comfort because what I kept saying to myself as a businessman, this guy, unless he just is is absolutely certain that I'm going to be found, yeah. Anyway, why would he want to extend this? Leave me out, yeah. Why would he want to waste his time? And and uh, and I got news for everybody. That's a false hope. And uh, and I, I get a sense, and I, I could be wrong, but you know, I, I I feel empowered to share the things I've learned, the things that I believe, because I hope it helps somebody. But I believe a lot of these attorneys, no matter how good they are, you know, this process takes a life of its own. It takes years. It's never months. It takes years to unfold. And as it unfolds, um, you, you get the sense from your attorney that he's not even paying attention to it. And, and, and what I mean by that is, I got the feeling my attorney didn't pay attention to my case until 90 days before my trial started. That's, that's not what I thought would buy into. And so I would, again, I encourage anybody out there, if you're, if you're anywhere in that journey to where you haven't gone to trial yet, you have to be informed, you have to ask questions, you have to self-advocate, just don't sit back and let the process take you where it's going to take you. Well, and of, course, be a bad and of course, the advice that you just gave is wholly consistent with what federal judges have told us, both on YouTube and off YouTube, that defendants have to, to mitigate. And even if you've gone to trial, you have an obligation to mitigate, right? Articulate fractures in your life, why you're still worthy of leniency, 
People might think it's in our interest to say this because we want you to pick up the phone, call and hire us. We'd love to help you. I'm conveying to you that we are channeling what we have heard from from wardens, from probation officers, from retired BOP, from federal judges. The onus is on you to take this advice that Ron and I are giving you or do nothing because your lawyer says, hey, sit back and chill. It's too early to prepare, even though an FBI agent with whom I spoke said, when we show up at your home, we're already in the bottom of the eighth inning. You decide what you all want to do with the decisions or with the advice we're, we're giving you. Let's transition then to, to trial. Uh, it is, I've said well, before, well, before, yes. Before we go to trial, yeah. can, can I add some one yes. thing to what you're saying? Because I, I, I've been waiting to get this out because I'm, I'm just shocked at uh, some of the people that I talk to in our community, like myself, they spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on their, on their counsel. And uh, uh, and then they 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 end up in a in a what they would consider a, a, a bad ending, whether they pled guilty or whether like me they went to trial and, and they were found guilty. What I'm always surprised about, and, and I don't work for white collar, yeah. but what I'm shocked about is they're found guilty and it comes time to start fighting for your freedom because that you, you don't start. People say you fight for your freedom in trial. I just you fight for your freedom after you've been found guilty. Because now we're talking about how 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 much time am I going to do? I'm always surprised at the amount of people that are like, I spent all this money with my tribe or with my attorney. The last thing I'm going to do is spend money to hire a consultant to help me uh, lessen my sentence. I'm going to do that on my own, and and that just baffles me. Uh, I didn't think twice when I came across uh, 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 prison professors, uh, Michael, which led me to you, which led me to white collar advice. Uh, the amount of money that I spent with white collar advice compared to what I spent to my attorney pills in comparison. Why would you not focus and put all your resources that you can to make sure you can get the best possible outcome? Well, and, and before you get that said, because I talk to people all the time and, and they're like, would you send me with your release plan? Would you send me your, your uh, allocution statement? Would you send me your pre-sentence report? Because I want to copy it or I want to paste why would you go cheap when we're talking about freedom? I don't understand. That. And that, and that's not. I, I just want to get that. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And plus, a lot of that stuff you can learn from it. But every case is unique. Your narrative and release plan is part of your life. It's what you've created. Yeah. I, I will say before we get into trial, what what baffles me is. We're, we don't really have this issue anymore 14 years into the space where defendants like, oh, this sounds great. I need the permission from my lawyer. That happened a lot when we came home from jail, when nobody really knew Michael or me or what we what, what we were doing. A simple Google search and a lot of lawyers know us now. So we don't really have that problem anymore. But every now and again, someone will say, I loathe my lawyer. I gave them all this money. They forgot about me when I call. Their assistant calls me back or they call me on the way home as if I feel forgotten. I didn't get the outcome. Uh, that I want. So they have a horrific experience. And then they say, this sounds great. Let me get the opinion of my lawyer. And my analogy is if you hired a fitness coach and six months later, you put on a hundred pounds, would you still value the opinion of your fitness coach? <laughs> it's, it's, that's what, that's what baffles me. Now let's transition to, to trial because so few people go to trial. The lion's share of people, as we know, plead guilty. What is that experience like go, going through a trial and have, hearing the government say things to a jury that of course you don't believe to be true, or they can exaggerate. They exa they engage in hyperbole where they're like they go down this road. It's like, but I didn't, I didn't do that. What is the trial experience like? Boy, I can tell you, I can't think of, of anything that's more challenging to uh, to a person's confidence and and overall well being than going through a trial because you're going to sit there, you know, probably eight hours a day. In my particular case, it was for three weeks. And you're going to sit through a trial and and hear the government um, uh, present facts that are totally twisted. And let, let me give you let me give you a, a, an example. Uh, there was a particular time in my interaction with Mark Ray, and and again, I was my focus is on my primary job, my my, my CEO job, but I was still helping him, and he had this big cattle sell, and it was a, it was a total disaster. And, uh, and through that process, the things that I was hearing and the things that I saw through the people in his company, I started to suspect there was something not right. And I sent out an email to, to him and to, to my co-conspirator, his partner. And I'm like, you know, I saw some things that doesn't look right. Uh, you know, I saw this, this. 
this and this, the sales are really, really low. Identify three people that do, that do not have cattle behind their investment. It's very crit critical that we get on the same page and get this pointed in the right direction. That's normal business talk for me. We got to get on the same page, let's identify where the problems are, cattle behind investments. That's what all that meant. The government takes that information and turns it around and claims that's me telling, uh, as they tried to tell the judge, judge advice, that I was, I was the primary guy in the conspiracy. That was me telling my, my underlings, we got to keep this Ponzi scheme going, but to keep this Ponzi scheme going, we have to get on the same page. So to tell you what that's like to go through, it's, it's gruel every single day. And in my particular case, I think every trial is different. My attorney kept telling me, I saw the, the prosecution bring in evidence after evidence and testimony and text and, and you name it. And I kept thinking, when are we going to have witnesses? And I remember asking, I didn't even know. I asked, it was like three days into the trial, I asked my attorney, who, who are you going to bring as witnesses? I gave you a list. And he goes, well, we've decided because I was tried with my, my, my uh, co-defendant. We were tried together. You know, I talked to her counsel and we've decided we're not going to call any, any witnesses. We think the defense or the prosecution's case is weak. It's not our job to prove you're innocent. It's their job to prove that you're guilty. That should have told me something. <laughs> that could have been further from the truth. As an executive, this is what we just, as an executive, the success you've had, you knew, you knew that was wrong. I knew it was wrong. And, and when I looked over at the table, and you understand there was myself and one attorney, my co-defendant had two attorneys. So, so three attorneys and her, her and I sitting at the table. Or at the prosecution table were three FBI agents, one SEC agent, one FDIC agent, and four prosecutors. Unlimited funds, you know, again, as a businessman, had I known that that's the way the deck gets stacked, I would have looked at it totally different. Well, let, let's talk about your old friend who you said you once considered a, a brother. I presume he testified at your trial? He did. It, it must have been gut-wrenching to hear, and this is probably like right out of the mafia movies where the, the brother speaks and you're thinking like, how could you, Fredo? Right. right. It, it, as you're hearing this, is it gut wrenching both to see it, but also to feel as if he's uttering half truths and inconsistent statements? What was that like, if you don't mind my asking? Well, I, I, this is going to sound odd, but oddly enough, it was reaffirming for me. And here's why I want to say that: uh, what we discovered is he he did 18 interviews. He lied on all 18 interviews um, and even admitted it. His last interview, he admitted he had lied on all 18 interviews. And as a matter of fact, in, in my case, when they interviewed the, the victims and then him, even with him, the very first interview, they say, name the people that you were involved with, who was involved in this with you. He names eight people. Myself and my co-defendant, we aren't either one of them. So from again, from the outside looking in, I'm reading this stuff and I'm like, this jury's gonna look at him and say, you know, this this guy's not credible, he's a liar, and we're not gonna believe it. So when I heard my attorney just kind of strip him naked on the on the stand, I I I felt I felt uh vindictive or, or, or I, I just felt that, that my story was being validated. That meant nothing to a jury. And, and unfortunately, what I learned through my particular case is when the federal government comes and they have that table of people that I told you about, and they say, this person is a bad guy. Now you add on top of that, not only is this person a bad guy, here's the guy that was with him, who we, we will readily tell you he's a liar and a bad guy. He's going to also tell you, that our guy's a bad guy. Jury looks at that and, and they say that there's, they must not have brought charges against him unless he's guilty. That's how the jury looks at it. It's my it, opinion. It, I just caution our, re our listeners. It's caution. Well, studies suggest that there's a percentage of people who are in prison who, who are innocent, and I'm not suggesting 
that you're maintaining your innocence or that in retrospect, you couldn't have done some things differently. I, I know that. I would like to transition to the, the day of the, the hearing the verdict. You, you sit down, you're called in. How long was the jury out? And what's the process like when you're just waiting for them to read the verdict? By the way, before I answer that, I do want to go back to, to the, you know, I, I was innocent and I should not have been felt guilty. I'm probably one of the unusual guys. Um, I should have been found guilty, and, I, and, and I'll tell you why. And I didn't even know, again, I didn't know that it was a crime. But basically what I was convicted of was willful ignorance, which meant I suspected something was wrong. I suspected that maybe there was a, a shady business going on. But rather than stand up and say something, I ignored it. And I took the, 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 the stance that as long as I'm, I ignored and I'm not directly involved, I'm not culpable. I didn't know that was a crime, but I got, I got news for everybody. That's a crime. So the reason I mentioned that, the reason it's important is that helped me deal with my situation. And I think uh, a lot of people that I talk to, including my co-defendant, if you can't get your hands around the situation you're in, forget if you think the penalty's just. I'm not, I, I think my penalty is terribly unjust. But if you can't get your hands around the simple concept of your involvement and your culpability in the situation you're in, um, the healing process is almost impossible. So the the, the day of your sorry, si no no that, that's those are very important points because the lion's share of people who go to trial and lose appeal and maintain that innocence, and you're acknowledging there are some things you did wrong, though at the time you didn't understand it. How long was the jury out, and what was it like hearing convicted on all counts? Uh, it was tough for me. My, uh, uh, my jury was out uh, for three days. And uh, what, what worried me is they rested on a Wednesday. So when we're going into Friday morning, again, I, I sometimes can't take my, my business, I can't turn my business mind off. I'm thinking like a businessman. I'm thinking that, you know, this jury is going to come in on, on a Friday. They're going to want to go home for the weekend and be done with this. You know, there, and, and so then you start to you chase the ghost in your mind. You know, I don't know what the, 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 the votes are that's dragging us out, but if it's not on the positive side, the guys that are holding out, they're, they're going to roll over because they want to go home. They don't want to deal with this over the weekend. So it's very difficult. Uh, so mine drug out for, for three days. Uh, as far as being found guilty on all the accounts, uh, that's, uh, an important point because we were called in and, and how the process works. If, if the jury has a question, um, the judge has to call counsel in, call the defendants. The jury does not come in. Uh, he, he then goes back and forth with the, with the, uh, uh counsel and the prosecutors to, to talk about how to respond to the question of the jurors. Well, our jury, which this, and the reason I mentioned this is this was the only thing I could have possibly appealed on in my, in my opinion. But the jury wanted to know if we could be found, if, if I, or let's just say me, if I could be found guilty of one of the seven accounts that I was, that I was found guilty on, um, or did I have to be found, if I was found guilty of count number one, the death being I was guilty of all seven accounts. And the answer that the that the that the judge gave back to the uh, the jurors led them to believe that if I was found guilty on the first one, that meant I was guilty on all seven, and, which is what happened to me. So, in my opinion, that that's how the complexion of the all seven count. So you're you're so you're both convicted. The the news sets in, and I know you're you don't complain. You're somewhat stoical. So I presume you just sort of took it so to speak. I know we don't want to get into your co-defendant other than acknowledging it was a different experience for her. And I think it, it has been the shock of this. So then you begin to mitigate. I know you're working with our team. You're inching towards a sentencing hearing. And the day of sentencing, and I will acknowledge for all of you, it's very easy to say you're going to be productive. It's another thing uh, you know, to, to do it. And during this window, Ron did the work probably on days he didn't want to do the work, right? But that's really what it takes to mitigate and try to change this government's version of events. 
And they're angrier than ever because he had the chutzpah, as Jews like to say, to even go to trial, right? They're angry if you plead guilty. When you go to trial, they double and triple down. Now, I know what your sentencing hearing is. I understand that the government tried to portray you to the judge in a light that you knew was incorrect. But I also sense because of your own mitigation efforts, the judge wasn't even a buyer of the government's version of events. I know that because they asked for 14 years. Can you touch on that, please? Sure, and 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 by the way, that that uh, that confidence, and, and again, I'm not saying this. The confidence came from you, white collar, Michael, prison professors, and the community. Uh, but going back to the work, when I was found guilty, I was I was in shock. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I remember coming home. I remember thinking my life is over. Um, what people don't understand is, and 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 you do, and people and the system do, but you know, when, when you're charged and those accounts, they carry like 20 years and they're, they're multiple accounts. And it looks like, a, you know, if you're reading an article, it looks like you're going to do 140 years of prison. And all you know is just what you hear. So, um, I was, I, I was really lost. And that's when I got on the internet and I started doing you know, research and I, I, I woke up and said that I, I giving up is not an option. I, I got, I, I have children, even though said her children, my youngest is 16, but I have kids. They're, they're counting on me. They rely on me. I am not, I am not going to allow this relationship with this one man to find my life. And, and what I mean by that is I had made a mistake in being involved with Mark Ray. That should, I was not going to allow that to erase 30 or 40 years of successes. There's no way that I was going to be defined as a criminal, I just wasn't gonna let that happen. So like you said, the work's hard. I got up, I started watching the webinars. I talked to you guys, I hired white collar advice. They started taking me down a path that I needed to go to show me how we could we could advocate for myself, how I could make a difference, make a change. Uh, I told myself every morning I would wake up and there were days where we all know it, I know you know it, you don't wanna get out of bed. And I made myself get out of bed because I told myself if 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 you will work on 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 the best possible outcome every single day, when you get there, at least you will know you had done everything you could to achieve best possible outcome. And that's what I did. There were days I didn't want to do it. I did. I got up. I worked every day. Every day I attended every webinar. Uh, I asked questions. I interacted. Um, so when I and just a side note to give everyone that's listening an example, the pre-sentence uh, report, which or pre-sentence interview, which again, unless you're in this process, you probably don't know what that is, but it's an interview that you do. It's done by a probation officer for the judge prior to sentencing that basically gets information for the judge that he can consider that wasn't part of the trial. It's about you, your background, how you ended up here what what kind of, of, of flaws that you have, personality and otherwise. They, they interview other people. Well, because of my relationship with Justin and Michael, I knew what a pre-sentence interview was. Not only did I know what it was, they were telling me, we need to create a pre-sentence narrative for you. Well, we're going to create this, this narrative that you can include in, in the pre-sentence interview that the judge will see. We're going to allow you to tell your story and your work. And, and not just have the only story being told coming from a probation officer. And I did that. And I'll never forget, as we did, I never said anything to my attorney, even though I was a little, little worried to take a man because I relied on the attorney for so long. Should I call him? Should I tell him I'm working on this? I made the decision not to. But we were two or three days from the pre-sentence interview, and, and it was time to submit the narrative that, that, that Justin's group helped, helped me prepare. So I called my attorney, and I said, listen, we have hired this group. I'm really happy with them. We've created a, a, a pre-sentence a narrative that I'd like to send to you and have you send the probation officer and have him include it in a pre-sentence interview. My attorney didn't know what that was. And he asked me like three times, what's a pre-sentence narrative? And I explained it to him. He goes, no, 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 Ron, you don't need that. Uh, 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 we'll do, we'll get on the phone. We'll get, it's a quick interview. They ask some basic questions. And, and we're done. You, know, you just don't need a pre-sentence. You don't need to do what you're, what you're talking about. That, you know, let's make it simple. Let's not answer questions they're not asking. I, 
I was confident enough in the work we had done together that I insisted. I told him, no, you are going to send this. Make a long story short, he did submit it to the probation officer. When I got on my pre-sentence interview, and by the way, on average, I think they last about two to three hours. My pre-sentence interview lasted about 15 minutes. And the first thing that my probation officer said to me was, Mr. Frogmartin, the pre-sentence narrative you sent me was very informative. I was very impressed. I'm glad you sent it to me. I've got to spend some work. I want to verify some of the answers, some of the information that you gave me. But bottom line is, almost everything I was going to ask you on this call, you've already answered. Now it's my job to go back and verify that it's true. So again, I want to tell that story because to just rely on what your attorney says, I'm telling you it's a mistake. So now we go through the pre-sentence interview process. It gets submitted to the judge. Now I might have gotten lost there. No, no, I think that's right. I'm glad you addressed the probation interview because so many people are told it is just a few questions and there's nothing really to, there's nothing really to, yeah, to prepare for. But before I turn it back over to Ron, federal judges have expressed to us, if you're going to give them a narrative, you should also consider giving one to the probation officer because this PO is going to make a recommendation to the judge on how long you should serve in prison. So logic, we think, suggests you should try to influence this person as best you possibly can. And to Ron's credit, unlike a trial when he knew they should call witnesses and they didn't, he wasn't going to double down. He wasn't going to say make the same mistake twice. He said, thank you. I'm going to go down this path. So we have the probation interview. We get the narrative copy and pasted into the report. And I know the report comes back and then the government at, at sentencing is asking, is that correct? They're asking for 14 years in prison and they're trying to make it out like you're the ringleader? Yes. And, and, and back to your question, I, I recall now I, I, was, I got a little bit off track, but but why did I feel confident when I went into this, to the, to the sentencing hearing and, 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 and why did I get the outcome I did? So the pre-sentence narrative, I, I firmly believe, was a major component. And, and and affecting the judge's decision mm-hmm. or influencing the judge. Uh, what followed after the pre-sentence uh, uh, interview was waiting on the report. The report comes out. You're going to respond to the report naturally. But then the next major step that happens from there is is your allocution statement. And again, my my attorney never said anything to me about an allocution statement. And uh, and when I learned of it through the team who I call her advice, I actually uh, wrote one. And I, I remember sending it to one of the team members, Larry, and, uh, um, <laughs> and within 15 minutes of me sending it to him, he sends it back, sends it back to me, and Larry's a super guy. So he does, he did not mean this condescending. He's like, this won't work. <laughs> and he goes, let's get on the phone and talk. And what I mean by that is they knew what an allocution statement should say. They mm-hmm. knew what would it, what should be in the allocution statement that would move the judge. And and I made those changes. I felt very comfortable in the changes. I understood it once it was explained to me. I then spent time, again, continuing the weekly webinars. I understood what the various sentences were, what it would look like. Uh, in my case, the judge, the, the, the prosecution was going after 14 years, which was basically tied it's a, it's a point system when they do the, mm-hmm. the the pre-sentence interview in the report so the point system talks about it, 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 it scores on many things but the biggest thing for me was the amount of money that mark ray had taken which was 16 million and that was the biggest thing that was affecting how many years the the prosecution was going after so the prosecution um went after the full they were going after the full thing 14 years uh, so now, fast forward to the day of sentencing. I felt confident. I, I, I had done everything I could do to position myself to have the best possible outcome. And, and I'm not, besides the big things like the pre-sentence narrative, besides the allocution statement, just knowing the, the simple things like I can actually request when I want to report to prison. You know, I don't, I don't have to have the judge tell me you'll get a letter from the Bureau of Prisons and you get that letter, it will give you two weeks to report. I can actually ask the judge, may I report 30 days from now, 60 days from now, and, and, and let that be on your terms so you can settle your own affairs and settle things with, with your family. Equally as important, I can actually ask for a camp. In my case, it was, it was a camp uh, uh, to 
be to be admitted to and one that's close to home one that's that's our that our that's another thing we should talk about because a lot of people don't include that in their in their in their personal narrative so you know you i knew i could request things and i told my attorney all those things now i'll never forget even on the on the surrender date my attorney looked at me he goes you know i can't guarantee the judge is going to accept it i understand but would you please ask for it so now we're in sentencing and uh the judge to sum it up the judge looked at the prosecution after they did their statements and i got to do my elocution statement well first he looked at me he said mr throgmorton he said i was very impressed with your personal narrative he called him out by name um and your your elocution statement thank you for submitting that i will allow you to read it in court if you would like to but i read it and and he didn't say move me i wish i could remember the words i was so nervous basically what he said was he understood what i was saying and he said uh he said you uh you are are a sharp businessman you're a seasoned seasoned businessman probably sharper than most that come in front and before me but um and you should have known better that that is for sure but then he looked over at the prosecution he goes however mr frog martin was not a primary uh perpetrator in this ponzi scheme it, it was obvious to anybody who was involved in this trial mr ray was he was the bad guy here and it's for those reasons and the information that mr frog martin uh presented in court that i reviewed that i'm going to do a downward sentence to six years and i gotta tell you the truth i had ran models because i knew i know i've seen i've webinars. seen i've seen the models <laughs> if i get if i get eight years it'll be this if i get nine years it'll be this i didn't even go down to six years yeah. because i thought it was just impossible so as bad as it sounds i came out of that out of that hearing on cloud nine and i know it's it, it sounds weird i mean how could you be excited about getting a sentence of six years i was excited because had i done nothing i could have gotten 14 years mm -hmm. not to mention the judge approved my surrender date which was on my terms and it was a, and a schedule that allowed me to deal with my family affairs and my business affairs he, he granted me the the prison camp that i requested which i knew had a RDAP program and would be convenient for for visitation um, i just walked out of there empowered and, and i feel I, I felt for the first time in, in a few years of getting my head beat in that i that i had i had a small victory i won and i won not by luck not because i had a really great attorney i won because i listened i paid attention i took to heart what we learned on our community and, and the advice i was getting from justin and michael and i was prepared and i advocated for myself and uh and i I'm, i i feel blessed because i did that it would have been a totally different outcome had i not done that well we feel blessed that, that we feel blessed that you're sharing this story i want to ask one more question and then we'll transition and wrap it up with some of your goals in custody You'd mentioned RDAP. When we talk about the pre-sentencing narrative or the personal narrative, it only works if the defendant is vulnerable and, and honest. If they give us happy talk or make-believe, it's going to be a useless document. It truly is a collaboration. And I opened up the interview by asking you to disclose a little bit of your trauma in growing up. And to your credit, it was a collaboration and you were incredibly vulnerable throughout this document, which is why it truly reflects the, the, the truth here. And in that document, you had disclosed some issues of substance abuse. We built that into the narrative in the PSR. And for those of you who don't know, that honest disclosure is going to both enable Ron to get treatment in prison, but could also lead to a shorter prison sentence. Is that correct? It, it is. And, and again, you don't know what you don't know. That's, that's, the, that's the curious thing about the journey that we all walk on. And, and, and most of us in the white collar side of this we're smart business people. You know, we, we, we like to think that, uh, that we can figure these things out, but you don't know what you don't know. And I, I didn't even know what our was. Mm -hmm. So when I was going through my, my initial interviews and stuff with, with white collar and, and as we laid out the plan and I took to heart, uh, what I was asked to be honest. And when it came to drugs and alcohol, primarily alcohol, I was honest. And, and yes, I, I, I had a drinking problem. The good news about that is my ex-wife, I knew when she would interview, she would be the first to attest to that. Uh, but that is so important because 
had I not known to be open about that, if I would have waited to my pre-sentence interview and been asked that by a probation officer, I would have been scared to admit that. Matter of fact, I wouldn't have admitted it because I would have thought it would have looked, it would have made me look more guilty. And, uh, and thank God I didn't do that because by virtue of what I did and more than likely being accepted into RDAP, the 12 month reduction in your sentence, that's pretty significant. And it's not all about the sentence. You're also going to get help. And I recognize that. So 12 months is, is, uh, you know. What you were was honest throughout the whole process. Let's be honest and wrap up this interview. Be honest with our team and everyone who's watching about what some, what are some of your goals in prison? I like to get it on the record because people are going to be able to watch this video at some point. You'll be home sooner than people think, and people will be able to say, he said it, he either followed through or he did not. So can you articulate some goals you have on the inside? Sure. You know, this, I think, goes back to, to the positive attitude that I'm trying to maintain. And again, not allowing um, a handful of mistakes to define a, a lifetime of successes. So I understand I have to go to prison and I have to, to uh, do the time that the judge has, has given me. But I am not going to go there. I'm not going to watch TV. I'm not going to play cards. I'm going to go there and I'm going to focus on myself. And this seems very odd. And, and, and for those people who happen to be listening with families, I would, I would mention this to you because I've learned it with my own. There are times where you're looking as I am to surrender in about 10 days that, that the, the concept of that is harder on your family than it is on you. You're the one doing the time, but your family, your kids, they, they feel helpless. They can't help you. They, they, they almost feel guilty because all the things that you've done as a father and a, and a provider and, and yet they're going away. And, and what I would say to you is reassure to them that what you're doing is positive because so much of it looks like punishment or banishment. You know, try to turn it around. And I, I told my kids, which is the truth. I'm hoping that I do 24 to 28 months. While I'm inside, I won't have a cell phone. I won't be getting texts. I won't be getting calls. I won't be conducting business. There'll be an opportunity for me to, to focus on myself. Um, uh, I won't have access to alcohol or drugs. Not that I do any. Um, uh, I won't be able to eat as poorly as I eat. I'll be able to focus on my, on my body, uh, and I'm going to read everything I can get my hands on. Um, I'm going to really try to write. Uh, I, I've kind of felt, uh, that's important. I have, I've done some writing so far. I'm going to set up a, a website and a blog. Uh, with my brother is going to help me do that. Uh, I want to document my journey. That's got a couple of advantages. One, um, you know, allows me to tell people what I'm doing, what I'm going through so they can see it. So I don't have to repeat it 10 different times when I talk to them. Um, uh, plus I think that it'll be a, a good opportunity for me to tell my story. I think it's an interesting story. People don't want to, want to, uh, uh, read. I hope. Um, and I'm going to take, I'm going to take as much programming as I can get my hands on. And, uh, and, and I look at it as why not? What else would I be doing? Why not take the programs they offer? Who knows what I can learn from it? And, and what I found is going or working with Justin and, and Michael and my collar and prison professors is I, 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 I found a, a passion, um, uh, in this industry and, and trying to help other people and, and even people in our community now, even though I'm not affiliated with either company reach out to me. They ask me questions. They send me emails. Um, and I found a lot of uh, redemption, I guess, if you want to call it that, and, and trying to pay it forward and help other people. And, uh, and when I come out the other side, uh, you know, I think to be able to truly help other people, you have to go through the entire process. And the next process I'm going to go through, and, I, and I'm going to come through with knowledge that I don't have now, and I'm hopefully come out the other side. I know I will. A better person. Well, we're, all of us, we're grateful that you contribute to every webinar that you mentor and, and work with others in, in our community. Glad we're friends. Spending so much time with you in Atlanta was a, a very good experience. So thank you again for taking I, I enjoyed it as well. Yeah, me, me too. Me too. Thank you for sharing this.
this story. We're all grateful. It's, it's going to help a, a lot of people in the coming weeks, months, and years. So thank you again for speaking so openly. My pleasure, and I can't wait to see you on the other side. You got it. Thank you, Ron.